So Heavenly Father, hear our hearts, listen, speak to our hearts this day as we hear your most holy word. May it bear fruit in due season. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. So very familiar words to just a few weeks ago, the gospel reading today. And uh, it would be remiss of me not to say thank you to all the children at the infant school for the crosses that are now appear in church, as usual, as celebrating Holy Cross Day a few weeks ago, and also to the ladies who have uh, flowered up the church, as it were. So congratulations to the Flower Guild as well. Uh, the harvest setting is lovely this year. So then, as we think about today, harvest season in a sense, uh, I just want to draw your eyes to the collect prayer uh, and just repeat it again, because I think that I would ask that we could pray this prayer daily throughout the harvest season. Such a wonderful prayer. Eternal God, you crown the year with your goodness and give us the fruits of the earth in their season. Grant that we may use them to your glory for the relief of those in need and for our own well-being. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Knowing the times and seasons of our lives is so important because, as I've said many times, life passes us by. We race through, and then only occasionally, when something stops us, do we get that chance to look back, to look up, to look around, and to try and locate where we are. And this prayer helps us uh, to do that. The words from Paul, so adequately and eloquently put, the point is this, the one who sows sparingly will reap sparingly. Now I know that I'm speaking to the choir today, as it were, and the choir as well, but you as a choir, as a congregation. But I just want you to, to consider in this harvest season your gifts to God, we'll speak today about the gifts that we bring for harvest, but also our gifts to God and gifts in the future, our legacy. Uh, so just consider those things as I'm speaking today. Luke indeed says, one's life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. Now, I've been quite uh, uh, listening to some Bach this week. It's Cantata 82, in fact. Uh, the bass soloist repeats the haunting refrain that gives the song its title, Ich habe genuf. Ich habe genuf, he repeats, which translated is, I have enough. And it was composed for the purification of the Virgin Mary in 1727. And it's quite a lullaby in a sense, melancholy, and there's all sorts of tones. It expands really on Simeon's words, if you remember, uh, when he saw the infant Jesus. Now, Lord, let your servant go in peace. Your word has been fulfilled. I have enough. Ik habe Genuf. We also hear him sing, I have enough, for I have taken the Saviour into my arms. I have enough. I have seen him. My faith has held Jesus to my heart. I have enough. Ik habe genuf. Really like I have enough, isn't it? You can really get the phrasing from it. And at that point, as in Simeon's original phrase, the singer 
is almost happy to die. And critics have said of this cantata that it's a little bit gloomy, uh, this focus on death. But I think, if you think about it, and also the reading that we've heard from Luke's Gospel today, perhaps they're missing the point. Because the parable that Jesus tells about the rich fool in his barns is not about death, but it's about life. It's about how to live your life, not about the need to die. So that's my first question to us all today. How are we living our lives? Jesus, in a sense, has been hijacked into this question, I think, because someone has, and that's why I read the first three verses, someone tries to uh, throw in a, a curveball, as it were, and ask them to arbitrate over some property. And Jesus turns around and says, who am I to be judge over you? And I'm sure he says that with his tongue in his cheek, in a sense, because we say in the creed, don't we, that he comes to judge the living and the dead. So he will be the judge of us one day. But on this particular occasion, as he's speaking to the disciples and the onlookers, he doesn't want to get drawn in to that. And so often that happens to us, doesn't it? Someone, you'll be talking, and then someone will throw in something and then takes you off course. Jesus didn't get taken off his course today. He reminds us, that life and the possessions that we have and loving God is what we were made for. When our earthly life is over, our possessions are left behind. But if we've cultivated that relationship with God, if we have that life with God, we will be for forever with him, eternally in his kingdom. Indeed, we will have enough. It have enough. Now, Jesus isn't saying that all material possessions, you know, are bad and we, that we should enjoy our possessions. But let's not hold on to them so that we're, nobody else can get them. It's about sharing our life together and giving of, to God and to other people. And knowing God, who you love, who have touched your heart, it's easier to give to someone when you love them than when you're disgruntled or you don't like them. I'm sure that you will give everything for the love of your life, won't you? Even your life, as Jesus gave his life because of his great love for us. We do not know the hour. We do not know the hour of our death or when Christ comes again. And all our plans, all the plans that we have, all well and good. But let's not forget to invest in the kingdom of God to seek the Spirit's treasures of love, of joy, and peace. That is what our community upholds, embraces, what we desire to be, what we are, and what we long to be in the future. So let's look at this season of harvest. It's not just today, it's the whole of October in a sense. We think of harvest, of the fruits in due season, of who we are, of how we love, of how we give, of how we invest, how we share our faith, how we use our talents and our money. And I love this word, that we absorb those commandments, those actions, and we love God with all our heart, with all our mind, with all our soul, and we love our neighbours as ourselves.
You'll hear me keep saying those words throughout this year as when we went away to Bridge North, we set forth who we wanted to be and I spoke about those two great commandments. Let them invade and soak up and fill and overflow from our lives together. Enough, they say, is a good feast. And we know how to feast here uh, at St. Catherine's. We know how to put on a good do, don't we? But that's how it will be day in and day out in the kingdom of heaven. And that's how it should be day in and day out here. Living, loving and learning with one another. Our life here, in a sense, should give us a taste of the future. Right then. Our relationships with one another, they're precious. And we should pray and love and care for one another with all that we are and all that we have. Jesus called the man who made bigger barns a fool because he remembered and thought about himself. If you know anybody who's like that, with all the love in your heart, go alongside them and put your arm around them and correct them politely. I heard a story about three apprentice devils who were coming to from hell to serve on earth. And before they left, Satan said to them, what are you going to do when you're in earth and on the earth? One said, I know what I'll do. I'll tell men that there is no God. And Satan said, that won't do because they already know in their hearts that there is. So the second one looked at Satan and said, well, I'll tell them that there is no hell. Then Satan said, well, that's even more hopeless. Even in their life, they'll have experienced the remorse and the regret of hell. And the third one said, well, I know. I'll tell them there's no hurry. Satan said, go, tell them that, and you'll have them in their millions. It's quite true, isn't it? When all that is said and done and you, your response is, well, there's no hurry. It'll wait until tomorrow. We miss that opportunity, that Kairos moment to let our will flow with the will of God to allow God to burst into our lives. Oh, it'll do next week. I'll bring it next week. I'll, I'll go and see that person next week. Oh, I'll write that letter to someone and say that I've been missing. I'll do it next week. So today, at the start of our harvest season, go home from this place and think and take stock. And all the things that you've been wanting to do but put off, get a little list together and start to put them into action. Start to break new ground. Start to sow seed. Because if you don't do those things, there'll be no fruit in due season, will there? If we don't cultivate our life, with God, with one another, there will be no relationship. There will be no love. It's as important as that, isn't it? Oh, that we could all say, Ich habe enough. I have enough. That's my prayer for us all, that we would be so bursting with God, with his love, that nothing would be too small for us to do. 
that we would be able to walk the extra mile, that we would share the load, that we would give gifts to God. So this season of harvest as a church, we continue to give to those who haven't got enough, who at the end of the month sometimes choose not to have a meal or to mend the washing machine. So thank you all today for bringing something for the food bank. Please continue to do that this month if we can. Let those tables be weighed down so much that we have to make several runs to the food bank. I know that the schools are having their harvest festival and Aston Flamble have theirs on the third Sunday. Let this be a bumper crop from this community this year. Ick Harbour enough. Your gifts and your love for the church Give generously this harvest season. We all know that life is difficult at this time. And we are all cutting corners a little bit and pulling our purse strings in. But the church is still here and open for work and worship. Help us in our mission. Give above and beyond. Give cheerfully to the church this harvest season. And lastly, thirdly, as you leave today, and I know many of you have done this, you'll be offered a legacy leaflet, something that you can take behind, and as you think towards the future, you'll be able to leave something for the church and for the generations that come. <clears throat> for what will your legacy be? Will you be one that keeps, knocks barns down and then keeps? Or will you be one that gives and sees the future and helps the saints that are yet to come? So there are three things that I ask of you and we will ask throughout our services in harvest to love God, love his people and to give generously. So we can all say, it harbour enough. Amen.